Okay, today I get to speak to somebody who I can uh, truly classify as a friend. His name's Trace Riddell. He was one of my instructors back at the University of Denver when I was like the oldest possible master student. <laughs> and uh, he was a real inspiration to me because he showed me the things that uh, the academic that academic study could strive to cover rather than just what I'd always seen covered. And so he was really into things like expanded cinema, um, the interesting people that were making sounds and making visuals and stuff like that. And he has and he is about to publish a book uh, that we're going to ask him about. So with all of this uh, introduction, let's go to talking to Trace. Hey, Trace, how's it going? Hey, Darwin, it's going great. I am so glad yeah. that you took the opportunity to to have a chat. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you for asking me to do it. Yeah, well, it's great to catch up too. It's been a while ever since I left Denver. It's been like uh, I haven't been doing a good job of keeping up with my old friends. Yeah, I know. We definitely miss you around every day. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So why don't we start off by having you explain a little bit about your work in the big picture, uh, your teaching work as well as this writing? All right. Uh, well, I classify myself as like a hybrid artist, writer, scholar. Um, I'm very interested in kind of the intersection of sound and science fiction, cinema, and I guess what you could broadly say a philosophy of technology. More lately, I've identified it as a kind of speculative materialism, uh, which is a branch of philosophy that's interested in kind of bringing the speculative aspects of philosophy down to the material of our existence. And so, you know, that's probably the kind of unifying factor of what I'm interested in right now, how to make ideas active, um, how to make them experiential, how to make them expressive in a variety of different forms, whether it's words in publication or whether it's sounds in electronic music or some kind of hybrid audiovisual performance. Right. Now, one of the things I'd say is that an, an awful, lot, awful lot of what you do, too, is sort of looking historically back at what people have done as sort of a way to inform a path for the future, right? Yeah, I think so, for sure. Um, in a way, I guess ever since I've started working in digital media or new media, I've always been really suspicious of the emphasis placed on the new and that there's this kind of allure uh, to this idea of doing the newest thing. And rather, it's been very important for me to express in my own work and, uh, and in my students' work, so therefore my teaching, this idea that, you know, nothing is just dropped fully form in the present out of the sky, out of nowhere. It's like <laughs> right, right. You know, part of a long continuum of, of people innovating and hacking and tweaking each other's innovations and it's more like an ongoing flow rather than it is like these really precise moments of, ah, oh, here's something new. Right. Now, the book that you're about to have released, uh, it's coming out on University of Minnesota Press, right? That's right. And the name of it is The Sound of Things to Come, an Audible History of the Science Fiction Film. Can you tell us a little bit about what we should expect when we crack open the cover? So it's really an attempt to lay out in a pretty comprehensive way, a comprehensive theory of sound, innovation, and narrative in science fiction films. Uh, it runs from 1924, the Russian film Alita, which technically doesn't have sound, although narratively it does have something to do with radio broadcasts from Mars, up through 1989 with uh, Al Reinhardt's pseudo documentary for all mankind so it roughly covers the analog years i barely get into digital technologies through tron and blade runner but mostly i'm really interested in this particular book on a kind of analog sound technology that takes off of course with the theremin and then goes through Vangelis's instruments and some of the sort of electronic studio mixing technology that would come into play in the later films. Right. Uh, I was lucky enough to take a class with you where you kind of uh, cracked open some of the, I think maybe the earlier thinking behind some of this. Uh, it was the, I can't remember even what you entitled the series, but it was something like the 
technologists of sound, of sound or something like that. I can't remember actually the name of the series. The Technicians of Space. Uh, yeah. The Technicians of Space. That's it. Yeah. 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 And um I remember being fascinated because prior to that the only time I'd ever really heard anyone talk about it was sort of like um uh the barons did you know forbidden planet and that was electronic music and then now here we are today you know <laughs> i was like well okay that's a that's a pretty rapid slope down the hill my, my assumption was there was something between but i didn't really hear much talk about it and so it was kind of fascinating but also the that you wove in not only uh what was found on soundtracks but also things that were influenced by science including uh, some of the some of the work coming out of Jamaica, some of uh, the work coming out of a lot of different kind of fringe musics too, uh, where they were influenced by science and space and technology as much as being about science and technology. Yeah, I mean, I've always thought this kind of audio innovation is really the primary critical platform you know, for people to think about sound. It, it's not like you have to have the sound in one place, uh, sound artists or musicians or engineers or technicians doing the work, and then you have this critical body of people writing about that work. Uh, in fact, in, in my thinking about it, it was more those artists and technicians were the critical thinkers that, that were working in the material of sound itself. And, you know, I think ultimately in the book, the person who's kind of rose to the top in this respect for me was Pierre Schaefer, creator of Music Concrete. And uh, the, I, his idea of the sonorous object became, you know, hugely influential in how I thought through this book project, but also how I've gone on to think about just sound making in general and working critically with materials. I want to come back to that because that actually, there's there's a lot to unpack just in, just there. But before we do that, one of the things I like doing in my podcast is talking to people a little bit about their background. Yeah. This sort of like clash between cinema and audio and, and music and uh, science fiction, uh, it seems like... It seems like something out of a science fiction tale itself, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about your background and how you got all this kind of divergent set of interests all pulled together in one head. <laughs> uh, well, I think I've always just been about trying to bring in my own interests and passion projects and things I love, which is sci-fi books and films and music, you know, into my professional life, kind of sneaking that in. <laughs> so I get paid to do what I love to do, I guess. So my background, I actually have a PhD in English literature, and before that, an MA in creative writing. But by the time I got my PhD, uh, I was really getting turned on to critical theory. I was very interested in sort of emerging hybrid philosophy around that time that was looking at digital technology. And then, of course, I was getting turned on by digital technology itself, which was emerging at that time. Um, and so my career path kind of took me into developing online classes in things like science fiction, fantasy literature, travel writing, but learning all these new tools, HTML, real audio for streaming lectures and audio mixes that I was doing. So that was kind of a piece of it. And then along the side, I met up with uh, David Fidel and Brian Comerford, who had launched uh, Radio Valve, an internet techno radio station, and told them about my record collection of space rock and old early electronic stuff. And they invited me to do an online radio show for them. And that was the first inkling of kind of, I guess, the community that the internet was opening up. It wasn't about consumption. It was about you know, doing this sort of real-time audio mix, chatting with people online while tracks were playing, uh, getting immediate feedback from a listening audience was just mind-blowing to me. Right. And it, it was a way to bring in this sound and stuff that I thought, oh, it's just my hobby, just collecting all of these weird <laughs> sounds. And so then as things morphed, I got to apply for this brand new field in digital media studies at the University of Denver and sort of started packing this stuff in. Oh, I was, uh, have this history and critical theory and text analysis, but then 
I've also got this online experience and I was getting into producing my own music more at that time, electronic music at that time. And so just, you know, to stupid sci-fi analogy, analogy, when worlds collide, you know, there they were, like <laughs> everything coming together and suddenly it's like, oh, this is my career. And right. I'll just say one last thing about it, that uh, University of Denver has really been an excellent place to work in this regard because they have allowed me so much freedom to design the curriculum that I love. So, you know, whether it be a sonic arts class or expanded cinema class or the sound cultures class, I think you were probably at some level in all of those in our time right. together. Right. And, you know, that was really me identifying a, a need that maybe somewhere else would have seen like a just kind of niche or, you know, an occasional elective class suddenly became a, a part of a, a curriculum uh, that really complemented, I think, the whole package of what we were offering in digital media studies and then later emergent digital practices. Right. Well, I think you were actually in a lucky position, though, too, of sort of sitting in the seat at a time when this stuff was all going through a redefinition. Because like maybe 10, 10 years earlier, media studies would be, hey, let's talk about what's a popular TV show, right? Mm -hmm. And then it sort of became, hey, let's learn how to become a good web designer. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it, it seemed to shift into this thing about let's do like a, you know, let's do critical thinking and critical examination of the art that's being produced in these digital media formats and let's let's treat it as if it's a serious body of work let's look at these things that have always been sort of like shrugged off as po popular culture and instead look at them from a, a cultural critique standpoint you were kind of in the right spot as that stuff was becoming acceptable right i think so and i i feel like it's sort of happening right now and of really fortuitous way, but with this emphasis on sound, you know, because when I first jumped into this field, I was into digital media studies, and now I'd probably identify maybe the primary thread of what I'm doing and what's now called sound studies. Right. And, you know, it's part of a general, partly a corrective, I guess, of a visual bias in media studies and the arts and fine arts and philosophy so to bring in sound as a as a way to rethink all of these sorts of things I just mentioned, these different fields, uh, has become, I think, hugely important. And it's really building up an exciting momentum, more and more conferences, more and more publications, you know, all coming to shape around this idea of let's study sound as uh, an important critical platform in its own right. Right. And especially especially separate from the musical study, because so often musical study takes a very specific path. Let's examine the notes that were used. Let's examine the rhythms or the tempos or the orchestration that was used. And I think sometimes the study of the music is at such a atomic level that it doesn't take a look at the broader level. And so I think it's interesting to bring an art critique style to sonic work. Yeah, I agree. And I also just really feel like with the musicology approach, what I noticed in a lot of the most most available work, I should say, on like science fiction films, that it was excluding what to me was the more interesting aspect of the films, which is sound effects, which is the overall sound design, right. which is the role that sound plays in the narratives themselves, you know, a lot of times. Um, and uh, so to really try to, I guess, holistically hear all of that stuff going on in a film became really a guiding part of this whole project. Um, I, I'm not trying to discredit musicology. There's a lot of musicological texts that totally informed this book and by thinking about sound. But the attempt to kind of classify what was happening sonically as music seemed a bit of a misstep in my in my opinion. Or at least maybe a little bit reductive for all the different things that were available to discuss, right? Yeah, reductive, <clears throat> I think, is, is the right word. Right. Let's talk then a little bit about this, about this book. Uh, so you talk about it being from uh, 1924 to 1989, which is a hell of a spread of time, <laughs> uh, especially when you take a look at what, you know, what that time frame represents, which is 
going from silent movies all the way to the point of having uh, soundtracks being an extraordinarily significant part of the sound. What for you, if you had to pick like two or three touch tone moments in terms of the films that were that were used, what are the things that really are center points for your book? Definitely Forbidden Planet. I mean, you know, the Barons just continually come back as kind of like the pinnacle. And I think in an early draft, I was actually trying to save that film for the very last chapter because to <laughs> me, it just like embodied so much, you know, it's like right. they're making all of the sounds, but they're doing the sound design. They're doing the musical score. They're doing sounds that appear diegetically within the film, like the music of the krill or the sound of the mind matter machine. And, um, you know, so they're doing everything with the same basic circuit bending and then tape mixing technologies that they were using. And so that film really became a kind of, I guess, the litmus test for the book of like how a film in sci-fi in particular relies on that on destabilizing our sense of where sounds come from right and that to me is kind of the essence of what makes sound alien and what makes hearing these films a alien contact you know that these are truly sounds that no one had ever heard before including the people who created them <laughs> you know hmm. that that to me is just mind-blowing it's like they don't necessarily know oh yeah i'm going to go out and make the sound of this robot or something. It's just like they're experimenting and coming up with new sounds and it somehow coalesces. It's like, oh yeah, this works perfectly as this character, this right. object or whatever it might be. So that's a pretty huge one. I think uh, Blade Runner is another really just such a crucial film for me. It too exhibits this quality. When you think about the entire sonic experience of the film as sound events that blur and blend these areas of our experience, whether it be Angelus's musical score or the sound design, sound effects of the film, it becomes really hard to like tease those apart. And at least in terms of a pop culture artifact, you know, that when that Blade Runner soundtrack finally came out officially, it had to recognize that, right? It had to have dialogue, it had to have some of the sound events um, incorporated on it. It wasn't just like a great render of what Vangelis had composed. Right. And what about, what, what were some things that were maybe prior to the Baron stuff? Because to me, at least, the Barons, when I when I listen to that, when I watch the film and I listen to the soundtrack, it is clearly electronic and you, you think of it as you're hearing electronic music, right? What yeah. were some bridge points to get from get to there? What were earlier experiments that might have been informing, either informing them or at least opening people's ears enough to electronic sound to make that a viable choice? I think probably the biggest discovery for me was Metropolis. And once they finally found enough, like, you know, it was really fortuitous. Like while I was working on this book, it seemed like a whole missing reel or something like that of content was found in Argentina in like a oh film house. God. And they were able to kind of reconstruct the film. They re-recorded uh, Gottfried Hooper's entire score for Metropolis. And that was really ear opening coming into contact with that material. Because, I mean, some of it had existed earlier, but it was really hard to find a version of Metropolis that had that original material. It was like, you know, new scores interpreting it, or it was, you know, piecemeal reconstructions of different people's, you know, music sort of attached to it. Right. And one, I guess, really, or really two important scenes early on in the film, after the opening credits, there's a visual montage of machine parts, sort of split screen and combined in a really fascinating way. And Hooper's music really changes at that particular moment from, I mean, I guess it doesn't change from because it comes before, but it really sets the tone with this kind of mechanical, modernistic sound that plays with a lot of repetition. It plays with pitch in a really interesting way. And you can hear him trying to create a machine music, you know? And so that to me was really interesting. And when you hear the rest of the film, it's these typical kind of like 
Wagnerian, romantic kind of familiar music. It's very humanistic mm -hmm. in its way. But mm -hmm. in that particular scene, you could just feel him reaching like something has to change because I'm not representing anything core about what it means to be a human. I'm expressing what it means to be a machine. Right, right. It's There's not a love theme kind of aspect to it. It, it literally is more evocative of the machine parts. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, and I just wanted to say, like, uh, I'll be quick about this one, but there, he reprises that kind of approach later in the film with a foxtrot and this sort of notorious, re again, reconstructed scene of the robotic form of Maria, the love interest of the film, who is sort of seducing all of these people at this nightclub with this, like, hypnotic dance. And as I read more about it, like the foxtrot was really considered a, uh, or a dubious musical form because it was all about this sort of unhuman, inhuman, mechanical timing, you oh, know, that right. had no connection to the human body. And so I just <laughs> thought it was interesting. It made me feel like, oh, yeah, he really, he really was striving for something sonically to kind of get at the core theme of the film. Right. Now, it's, that's actually a really great point because one of the things that seems to me that almost is the hardest thing to do when you're doing these kind of critical studies on something, and in fact, sometimes feels like a reach, is trying to determine the thought process or the, or the intent behind what people are doing. And so there was a case where because of referring back to this and utilizing the fox, foxtrot and understanding a little bit about the background of that, you were able to at least infer what what he what his thought process was about right yeah what are some other places where you saw similar things uh things that things where there was sort of a clarity or there was like a reveal for you once you started digging in deeper it was all of a sudden like oh my god it's this way because of x well i think one interesting moment like that was probably Barbarella, which I hadn't watched in a really long time <laughs> until working on this book. And I think there was just this, what, what had a previously struck me as a really kind of like hackneyed, piecemeal score, just almost incongruous music. You know, it felt like a Woody Allen film or uh, Casino Royale, the original version of that James Bond film, which is so psycho and wonderful, you know, but it's like, what, what is all this? Just like pop music, but there's lounge music, and then there's like orchestral music, and then there's weird electronic sounds. And I just always had previously kind of dismissed it as a mess, but I think coming back to it um, and guided by some of the research that I was reading, I really began to hear that as like a strategy for that movie that the they were really interested in kind of blending this strange like post 50s space age bachelor pad lounge music <laughs> with with this kind of turned on like psychedelic music you know from the mid 60s right. and blend those together and and fit Barbarella as this kind of uncomfortable female protagonist between those two worlds, you know, where she's partly, you know, the striptease artist who's appealing to the bachelor pad, but she's also kind of liberated and in charge of her own sexuality, potentially, choosing all number of partners and all species of partners, right. you know. And so somehow that kind of polyglot soundtrack uh, really started making sense to me as like, very much in keeping with the tone and tenor of that, that whole film. Sure, sure. That makes a lot of sense. Now, one of the people that you described earlier in the discussion was uh, the influence of Pierre Schaeffer and not only his techniques, but some of his philosophy of sound. Yeah. And I think that there's a lot of important touch points there because he also, because Pierre Schaeffer was so interested in the quality of the sound rather than the notes that they produce... He actually struggled to try and document the work or like score the work ahead of time. You know, he put a lot of effort into it and not always with a lot of success. And I think that that's something that we see a lot of times in films, film scoring, but especially film scoring around science fiction, which is that so much more of the soundtrack and, and the sound effects and all of this stuff 
really relate more to the timbre than to the notes being played. And so I'm curious about how you see that part of it, the the sort of like ephemeral nature of what's being recorded. I mean, it makes it seem like almost all of this stuff has to be in a way kind of improvisational because it's yeah. it's hard to pre it's hard to predetermine and document ahead of time, right? Yeah, totally. And I think that's part of what you know I was alluding to earlier when talking about the fact that like a lot of the musicians hadn't heard these sounds before. Right. You know, they were truly in this kind of moment of improvising with a, a new technology, many of which at times they themselves were developing, and just hearing what came out of it and documenting that directly to tape. And then doing further experiments with it from there. And so that that too seemed like a real Schaefer-esque sort of moment that was throughout so many of these films of like the process doesn't stop at the recording. Frequently it be- begins at the recording. Right. And then you go on through this whole other process of mixing and running things backwards and, you know, doing all that fun tape music sort of stuff to really create the the sounds that you're hearing. Now, you said that that his concept of the sonorous object was actually really influential to you. Could you, could you explain a little bit more about what that is and how, how it was influential to you? The sonorous object is is interesting because it's it sounds like it's really tangible. You know, it's like, oh, it's an object of <laughs> right, some kind. Right. But actually, at the heart of it is this kind of, to me, again, this alien displacement. Like, the object... The more you try to pin down and Schaefer like where the object is, the less and less certain you become about that. It's it's not in the mind of the listener, it's not in the ear, it's not in the tape that has this thing recorded on, and it's not in the thing that made the sound. You know, it becomes very very difficult to say exactly where it is, and it's partly because of that that to me it becomes really a, a great way to try to think through alien sound objects, you know, this encounter with the unknown and never heard before. It doesn't come from around here. That's all we can kind of say about it. And I want to try to tie this in. So I was excited that you brought up this idea of of timbre. And I think it's related to this sonorous object idea. But one of the things I was really, again, kind of discovery in the writing process of this book was this idea that musical motifs, a particular segment of tones that represent a character were frequently less important in sci-fi than what I call a timbral motif. You know, you mm. you recognize Clay II as an alien, looks just <laughs> like a human guy, right. has a, takes on a human name, but you know he's alien because whenever he's on screen, there's some hint of theremin, right. you know, that's kind of like his, it's been described as a halo or an aura or a vibe that sets him apart as kind of odd or weird or uh, or alien. And so I find that happens like a lot uh, throughout the history of sci-fi, that that timbral quality gets associated with characters or spaces um, in a way that by the time we get to like Star Wars or Close Encounters, the retreat back to these melodic motifs starts to seem a little bit backwards. You know, mm-hmm. it, seem, it seems a little bit like um, a very conservative sort of gesture, I think, to give us these really clear sequences of notes that you can slow down or speed up to sort of really direct the audience's supposed reaction. Right, but still always imply that Darth Vader is just off screen, right? Yeah, exactly. Now you talk about, uh, with Klaatu and, and the appearance of the theremin there, the theremin actually for quite a significant period of time really was the calling card of science fiction soundtracks, it seems like. Science fiction and, and kind of horror, too, but mm-hmm. uh, it, it was a really big thing. Why was it just because it was uh, it, it had a bizarre tone, or was there something you think about the theremin itself and its construction or its the way you play it that really drove people to use it specifically for these sounds? Yeah, I think all of those pieces are are part of it. I mean, it's like the kind of classic black box technology. You know, it's it, you can't really see based on its controls wh- how a person is making sounds. What you do see is totally mystifying and mysterious. It's just hands moving around, antennas. Um, so it violates our sense of like, oh, you have to touch things in order to make sounds from <laughs> right, them. Right. Uh, so that's kind of odd. 
I think not just its timbre, but specifically the quality of the glide um, is a real interesting, oftentimes anxiety producing sound. We associate that with sirens. And as you probably know, the you know theremin originated out of proximity burglar alarm research right. that theremin was doing. So it really, you know, initially was just a siren of sorts. And so I think just all of those qualities get kind of bundled up together to make it the original sci-fi instrument. Yeah, the thing that I find actually kind of remarkable about that, though, is that of almost all the electronic instruments, it's kind of the most human in that while you're not touching it, I mean, it's paying attention to your limbs. When you have little tremors in your hands, you're going to end up with a vibrato in the note, right? I always thought it was really interesting that it was considered the most alien instrument when in a lot of ways it was very humanly expressive. That's a really interesting point. I think it's like um, it really points towards this kind of like relationship between the human body as artist, as performer and the technology. Maybe there's a tendency in some of the sound and sci-fi research to put too much agency into the machines. Right. And not into that kind of relationship. Right. I think that's a really interesting point. Yeah. Now, one of the things that you talked about is that you kind of followed uh, this sound through the analog area era and pretty much stopped there. What is it about the analog basis for these soundtracks that that really ended up being the thing that you were interested in? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll be up front. Like, part of it was like a practical decision. <laughs> like, it was already <laughs> a really long project <laughs> and had to stop somewhere. And so, like, okay, 1989. And, and at, at one point, there was like a big gap, like a conclusion tried to, like, pick up, you know, like, oh, I really want to talk about, like, that weird interstellar score or, you know, Blade Runner 2 came out. And I was like, this is going to be never ending. You know, right, it's like right. a new interesting film is going to continue to come out. And I had this weird missing decade of the 90s. And so I really just decided it needs to stop here and then I can like pick up this thread. And But then I started wanting to think about that so that it wasn't just a, a practical decision. And, you know, really do think that there's potentially something so transformative about digital technologies and digital editing that does deserve like more closer attention, I guess, paid to it and a closer listen given to it than I was able to for this project. And so then kind of retro engineering back into the book, it just really started seeming kind of part of my discovery of materialism, of speculative materialism. And, you know, so much of digital technology is talked about as though it were immaterial. It's everything's reduced to zeros and ones. And it's kind of binary thinking. Although, of course, we know it's equally material but somehow going back to this like interest in electronic circuitry and instrument design um, well, and tape i mean in a way by ending at 89 what you did was you kind of worked your way through the through the whole series of time where these processes were really hands-on there was not a lot virtual about them even if you were using a synthesizer if you were if you're in, in uh, Vangelis' studio, there was plenty of stuff to haul around. Right? <laughs> yeah. there, was, there were plenty of tapes to be cut and wires to be run. And it was, it, was a, you know, it was a very physical interaction with the music and the music-making devices. Something that really isn't as much the case in digital world. Now I can, I can score a movie on my laptop at a coffee shop or at least I could if somebody wanted me to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was uh, the analog era really was a, a time where there was a physical interaction. I mean, even if you think about like synchronizing the tapes to video and, and the kind of cutting and editing process that went on, it was a very physical interaction with these devices. Yeah, and it led to, again, this kind of continuing like sense of contingency of like the machines kind of having their own agenda and say <laughs> within human ingenuity coming around. So I loved reading about Wendy Carlos, you know, trying to figure out that time code synchronization and getting her hands on some of the first devices that would allow that. But then realizing that when 
the film was being cut, I'm talking about Tron here, when the film was being cut, all of the things that she had composed were way too long. Right. And so she had to come up with a, her own computer code language that would just let her like tune into these little like, oh, I need like a 20 second thing here and just made this massive database of time stamped clips with some mood indicator, you know, that would say like, oh, I need this little segment of the love theme here. And, and she kind of hated doing that to her work, but it was, you know, kind of, again, just a really interesting, like, okay, I've got, I've got to do this with the tools at hand to make this happen where now you could just, you know, program something that would do all of that all of that for you, I think. What were some of the popular influences on science fiction music? I mean, I think, you know, I think when most people in their head imagine what science fiction music sounds like, it's sort of like out of left field came the Barons, and now all of a sudden we have a squeaky Krell music and stuff. And um, at some point, uh, somebody fell asleep on a Yamaha CS80. <laughs> and then we ended up with the really big electronic score sound. But, you know, I'm wondering where in as as you go through it, and you've gone through this, obviously, in a lot more detail than any of us will have. What are other influences that you see? I mean, did you do you see things like uh, Lee Scratch Perry's dub stuff coming in and having an influence, or I mean, I think clearly we can we can imagine where the psychedelic music had its influence, but what other things might have come in and had uh, and had their own influences? I think probably like the biggest influence that happened throughout pop music that related to the book and that I talk about at some point would would be just this conception of the studio itself as a musical instrument. Uh, that's certainly something that the dub artists were realizing. It's something that producers like Brian Wilson or uh, George Martin working with the Beatles had all discovered, you know, that it's not just, again, taking this sort of pure, pristine sound object that happened in the recording booth and presenting it as it was there's so much that's going on after the fact to actually assemble that that you know we have to treat the mixing as a uh, creative activity in its own right and uh, so in these films you definitely hear that with like Bernard Herrmann um, and the day the earth stood still where I really think until you know I was deep into that chapter um, I came across a description of the work that he did to create the whole sequence where the earth stands still and the way he was isolating instrument voices and cutting off the attack so that they just sound like these alien, like just sudden sort of appearances of sound without any buildup and oftentimes without decay either. Like all of those kinds of innovations to me really seem the essential kind of overlap between what was going on in these films and what was happening in all different kinds of music. And then flipping the script on that, how do you think that uh, that these musical stylings and directions and stuff have come back to influence music now or music of the recent past? I mean, I certainly feel like a lot of what we're seeing in, as sort of the rebirth of modular synths, but certainly ever since techno brought us the rebirth of the analog synth, Mm -hmm. There's also been a renewed appreciation for the kind of techniques and sounds that were part of uh, classic science fiction film sound. Yeah, I mean, like so many artists, uh, you know, Derek May, of Cybertron, and Altecker, you know, all these, uh, Aphex Twin. I mean, I think like all of these sorts of like premium techno artists and electro artists and stuff would not be around if it weren't for sci fi films. I mean, I think there was something about latching on to the alien quality, which fits in so perfectly with Afrofuturisms in particular. But, you know, there's also these just like bedroom producers, like I mentioned, that, you know, were kind of, I think, attracted to the kind of placelessness or the not of this world quality that they had absorbed from sci-fi sounds. And so it si simultaneously kind of gives you an identity on making this sort of space music or sci-fi music. But it also identifies me as someone who doesn't quite fit in with pop culture or these sort of more widespread musical styles and stuff that they maybe define themselves against or outside of. Right. 
Right. Does that make sense? I mean, what do you, what yeah, do you think does. about that? I, I think that's I think that's an interesting thing where it's literally a a telltale of where you're coming from by using some of those sounds and ideas. And I read, you know, an interesting article, actually several things like would refer to how the science fiction film allowed like avant-garde sounds to be smuggled into pop culture, you know, <laughs> right, like someone right. would encounter like some weird sound in a sci-fi film and it would totally make sense to them, but they wouldn't sit through like, I don't know, Paulina Oliveira tape music show right. in the mid sixties or right. something like that. It would right. be like completely like, uh, what, what's going on here. And so it somehow allows that. And yet the sci-fi film retains this kind of avant-garde quality. You know, it's not just like we're making it safer for consumption. We're just giving it this different avenue where it can really transform a whole bunch of listeners' ears at a very with a very wide sort of sonic footprint. And so maybe that's something else that kind of attract these composers sort of after this music, that there's this sense of doing work that is simultaneous, popular, whether it be dance music or whatever, but then is also still ex- very experimental and very open to sort of discovering new sounds on the fly. Sure, sure. Um, man, our time is practically up here, but I have to, I really want to squeeze one more question in, which is this. So you, you've you put in so much time studying science fiction, film, sound, and music, what have you heard of recent vintage that really caught your ear? And does it catch your ear because it's new and different or because it's reiterating those old, you know, some of the themes that you heard from the past? So I'm curious, first of all, what do you hear that you find interesting? And secondly, why is it that that in particular interests you? I mean, I think for a while it might even be why I kind of dropped the book off when I did too. It's just kind of like, I was getting really sort of saturated by all these sounds, and it was hard to determine what was really new about contemporary science fiction sounds. You know, they, beyond like a, an incredibly significant increase in volume. Like that was the main thing. Like at Interstellar, I was hoping, I was hoping you were going to say in, increase in sophistication. <laughs> no, <laughs> man. It's all about volume. You know, it's like. <laughs> Interstellar, The Martian, right, right. The New Blade Runner. I mean, all of those are really about getting this sort of saturated volume and vibration of sound in that respect. And yet sonically, whether it be timbrally or uh, melodically, they seem to be gesturing sort of back back to the past. So I, I think like some of the more interesting contemporary sonic experiences, I thought Under the Skin was a really interesting sonic movie that had a lot of open spaces in the sound it's kind of what i recall about it it's been a while since i've seen it and listened to it uh some of black mirror i think is very interesting because in that film i really feel like it's captured this idea of some of the more interesting sounds coming from the imagined world which is very you know not non-diegetic sounds laid on top of that world and so how those sounds are so close to our present moment and yet slightly off i think is really effective kind of transformative sound event now one of the things that came along with the introduction of digital everything was sampling Do you hear much interesting use of sampling? My sense is that within the context of this kind of music, it's it's not often used in a very creative way. No, I like I think even when you mention that, uh, most immediately what pops to mind might be some sample field recordings. You know, like interesting new sounds are kind of derived from that. But I would be hard pressed to kind of point to something specific that. I don't know that's coming to mind with that. But. Sure. Okay. Well, Trace, I I want to say thank you for taking us on this journey. I mean, it's first of all, it's got me wanting to... I actually have a copy of Metropolis here where they did some kind of score. I don't even know what the hell they did. But I, I got to crack that thing open and, and give it another run through because you've kind of lit my, my head on fire. I go and watch <laughs> Forbidden Planet again. I'm not sure I'm going to want to watch Barbarella again, but maybe I'll give that a try. <laughs> but in any case, uh, I want to thank you for uh, opening some doors here. It's, it's really been great. 
All right. Well, thank you so much. And yeah, I just really appreciate you taking the time to let me talk about this book some. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. And it's, again, a real, a real eye opener. Well, with that, I'm going to let you go have the rest of your afternoon. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, Darwin. Many thanks to Trace for having the chat. It was really great to go on a journey learning a little bit about the music and sound of science fiction. If you're interested, you're going to want to take a, a look at his book. It's coming out on October 16th. It's called The Sound of Things to Come, an audible history of the science fiction film. Uh, the author, again, is Trace Redell, and it's on University of Minnesota Press. Uh, I want to thank everybody for continuing to listen and for all of the emails and the support that I'm getting from everyone. I really do appreciate it. If you are so inclined, jump over to YouTube and subscribe to the channel. Uh, we're getting a lot of subscribers lately, and it's just kind of encouraging to see those numbers go up. So as always, I want to thank you for listening, however you listen. If you want to drop me a line, you can do so, ddg at cycling74.com or darwin.gross at gmail.com or ddg at 20objects.com. I get all kinds of e email addresses, but drop me a line. I always like hearing from you. And with that, I'm going to let you go. Have a great one. Bye.